Welcome back to another episode of The Debrief. As always, I'm Tyler Norton from Plastic Weekly, uh, and we have our consistent co-host, John Bergman, uh, the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing, joining uh, this time from Salt Lake City instead of his basement outside of uh, Indianapolis. <laughs> and our special guest for this week is MC Pete Woods uh, from Alberta, Canada, but joining from Salt Lake City, where he is recovering from his very first IFSC commentating gig and revving up for his second one in about like what four days or something like that um thank yeah. you both for joining us uh let's uh get getting started really quick um Pete a lot of people you know I was the only one of the three of us that had to watch this on the internet so I am the only guy that has to suffer through the YouTube chat right and one of them the recurring questions was like, who, who are the commentators? Right. Cause they just don't know. And they also didn't show your face at any point. I was kind of disappointed. You guys got no headshots for recognition or whatever. So can you just tell people like who you are? Yes, absolutely. And it's funny because I watched the first world cup in Meringen and they did all of their interviews and they did their kind of lead in intro and the voiceovers. And I was like, I trimmed my beard and I got like, of course, you know, you gotta be, come correct and then they had this new protocol where everything was off camera so they're like you're never going to be on a camera i'm like okay that's great um but my name is pete woods and i have uh, been in and around competition climbing for almost my entire climbing career of about 25 years i have coached i have competed i have retired i have coached again um and in the last sort of six or seven years i started picking up um being involved in competitions as either an MC on the floor and then in about the last five or six years as broadcast commentary um, slow to pick up in Canada but have done uh, most Canadian nationals and then the block shop series of major comps and have just been chipping away at trying to get my name out there as somebody that does competition climbing commentary and uh, I'm super passionate about it so I'm just continuing to work at it and I'm having a lot of fun. Yeah, man. Pete, Pete, can I ask you a, a question about how the IFSC gig came about? Because I think to a lot of people in our world, fans of competition climbing, and certainly anybody that's into commentating and commentary for competition climbing, the IFSC gig is is kind of like I mean that's the big the big dream job. And and so I'm curious how how um, since there's such a, a history of European commentators for the IFSC from Charlie Bosco and, and Matt Groom and all that, how, how did uh, a Canadian uh, end up with the job? I'm taking the notes during from... this segment, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the kid from Canada. Um, so I had seen, I had reached out um, to Charlie a little while ago and um, had uh, suggested that I might come down and, and work with him in Vail. And he had said, yeah, kind of, you know, maybe we'll see. Um, and it didn't really go anywhere. And I have reached out to the IFSC a couple times before that. And it, it's hard to crack into that. Um, and I was just sort of playing the long game with it. And then uh, when I saw in the summer that he was retiring, I just, uh, I have a resume that I use. Um, and it's up to date with all the comps I've done and video links and all that. And I wrote, I sent, I have a couple friends that, uh, that play in the big league. So I asked a few of them. Uh, and I asked uh, Sean and a couple of my um, you know, root set of friends, who would I, who's the best person to send this to, to get past the screening of just, you know, writing to info at IFSC. And uh, I got in contact with the person that's in charge of doing the comp, the broadcast and said, Hey, here's what I do. Here's who I am. I'd be super excited to work with you. Here's my resume. Let me know. And I sent it off and then just sat back and went, you know, the only thing you can do is throw it out there. And they wrote me back two days later and said, yeah, we'd be interested. Um, how about a call next week? I said, okay. And I jumped on a call um, with Anne from the IFSC and Nick, who is, uh, they brought in to bolster the broadcast. So he's a longtime BBC commentator and he's here to provide information as they try and ramp up the quality of the broadcasts getting into the Olympics and, and et cetera, et cetera. And I jumped on a call with them and we all got along really, really well. And we liked exchange of ideas and they said, we'll let you know. And then like months started ticking along <laughs> and they dropped me a note in January and said, yeah, uh, you're going to do the Salt Lake City World Cups if you're still interested. Uh, Matt's going to do the European ones and then the Asian ones are still up in the air on the calendar and we'll decide who does them. 
and and the best part it killed me in the email if you're still interested and i was trying to like find a calm way to reply of hell yes i'm still interested and i was like absolutely definitely interested thanks so much like you know you try and be a little bit reserved in your you know um because you you work hard for something you don't want to sound like you know oh it's this amazing um it's just lucky or you know thanks so much it's you have to feel like you deserve it as well so you have to play a bit of the amazing opportunity thank you and also yeah absolutely of course i'll do it yeah only if you guys need me you know like you, you know don't you know <laughs> if yeah. you play too cool and they say never mind we'll yeah. call the next guy like you can't blow it you have to be a little bit excited what did you ever do any sort of i, I don't know what the ter screen test might be a little lofty but but you know chemistry is a big thing in commentary and and you worked with megan martin for for this particular one um, when did you meet Mark, Megan, and when did you kind of uh, start kind of working with her uh, prior to this broadcast and communicating with her and all that? We, um, so the IFSC, they said, you know, talk, reach out to anybody you want to do the color commentary. And I know a couple people, so I have been sort of thinking that, as we all know, the IFSC model is pick up an athlete that didn't get through from the previous round. And sometimes that works out wonderfully. And sometimes it works out less wonderfully. Um, and I was thinking, I know some people, especially some people in Salt Lake because of the USC training center, there's lots of people there. Maybe I could get somebody who's had some experience on air, who's not that far removed from competition climbing. So I reached out to a couple of people that I know and they were interested. And then uh, I had been thinking about Megan because she does the ESPN broadcasts. And then Anne wrote to me and said, we would love it if you worked with Megan. Can you, you know, reach out to her? So we connected um, through IFSC, actually, and we got on a, a phone call right away and, and just had a chat and kind of got a feel for each other. And then we jumped on a video call for about an hour uh, the next week and talked about what we like and don't like about broadcasts, what we're, you know, want to talk about, what we like to highlight and you get an understanding for somebody's, you know, their, a bit of their pacing and a bit of how long they speak for and these kinds of things. So we developed that over a couple of phone calls. And then uh, she came in, flew in straight from Vegas from filming an American Ninja Warrior, landed, drove to the hotel, drove to the venue, caught the second half of qualifications. And we just sat in the, in the audience and talked climbing. Um, through the entire rest of the qualifications and then rolled up on Saturday morning and went ready and off we went so we didn't have any we didn't run through any practices we didn't sort of pull up an old stream and, and mute it and commentate over it or anything like that and something we thought about and maybe I would have done with somebody who'd never really been on air before but Megan's experienced and she's I mean if you've met her before or seen her on Brax, she's super high energy she's super smart and that, so i knew there was going to be no issue of having a co-commentator who was going to go and not say anything mm -hmm. yeah no i thought that the you guys did a great job um uh i think that the the funny part like i was really excited to watch chat because you could probably predict where chat goes right the first thing is is they're like I don't know who this person is. Therefore, I want the guy who I know, right? Like, where's Matt Groom? Mm -hmm. Blah, blah, blah. And then they start asking. And then by the by the end of the weekend, it's completely forgotten, right? You're not getting any comments, which is exactly what you want when you're on a broadcast. You don't want people thinking about you. Um, so it was it was awesome. Like, you guys rode the trajectory great. You got a ton of buy-in from the people that were watching. So excellent work. I had, I had a, a kind of um, just a commentary question to ask. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll get to like the climbing stuff in a bit, but um, on women's number four was this kind of classic climbing scenario um, for anybody wondering uh, Pete's in a cafe right now and there's a door chime. So every time somebody walks into this apparently very successful cafe, you're going to hear that bell in the background. Uh, it's all good. It's at least we have good internet. Um, so anyway, the, the question is women's number four. Your last couple athletes are spending a buttload of time trying to make progress and they're not making progress and the clock is ticking down. And guess what? Like you and I both know, most of the time that means you're not going to get a top. Um, but they might get a top. And in this case, obviously one of them did and it was a fairy tale ending. But I wanted to ask you personally, um, how, how do you process that? And what are you trying to, um, you know, 
I, I'm sure you're fighting with, you know, I want to leave the door open for the possibility, but I don't want to oversell something that likely won't happen. Like, how, how are you uh, dealing with that kind of scenario? It's such a good question because it's, it's uh, the thin line of both the living nightmare and the potential perfect scenario. Mm -hmm. So you have to tiptoe along it and not throw either one out. So you're thinking, I, you think when the other person's talking for the most part, so you know, you have this balance of conversation and, and you think while they're talking and you think, okay, we can talk about um, what's probably going through that person's mind, the climber's mind. So you kind of, you go through the stages of, are they doing the, the beta right? Are they going to tweak their technique? So you have a couple of those attempts and that's how you end up with 10 attempts to stick that zone. And as you say, anything after five, you're, I mean, the learn movement is one thing, but when you are basically the same distance away from sticking a, a six foot dyno the odds are getting lower and lower oh we lost him let's see if I... oh he's back sorry go ahead man okay um you have to sort of play out the if she gets it she will win card just so people know that there's stakes you know stakes is high um and then you just keep people interested so don't turn away this isn't it's not fruitless you go back to a bit of technique. You go back to if she just does this, that'll be the difference. You know, she's got to compose herself. So you, you kind of just ride a bit of the wave of what you would do. So you get inside your own head as a competitor, which helps. Having been a, a long-time competitor, I think makes a huge difference to competition commentary because you know what it feels like to stand on the mat for three minutes and 30 seconds in front of a 1,000 people and be woefully unsuccessful at something um, and you want to crawl under the mat and run away you want to throw things or you want to throw yourself at the wall and try it 20 times so you have you get to play on your own knowledge of what it feels like to be in that position and it lets you empathize a little bit with that athlete and not over or undersell what they're going through and then also just be ready when she sticks that hold this is the finish that you were dreaming of mm -hmm. Yeah, I there was so there was a bunch of moments where the camera was uh, side on angle, so you could see Natalia contemplating, but in the background is uh, Oriane, right? And you you would mention her a couple times, and in my head I was like, I think the way because I at that point I would have given up. I would have been like, there's no chance this is going to happen, and I think I would have started playing up the, the the angle of like, okay, this is now Oriane's story. Oriane is counting down the seconds to this huge victory. But there's a certain amount of guilt of like not not giving credit to the climber on the wall. Although it, it anyway, that's that that was kind of where I was coming from it, and I'm I'm glad you didn't because it it worked out great. Um, like a, a genuine fairy tale moment, it was perfect. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a rough scenario that honestly comes up a lot, like in every single comp. Um, it's and like, it's yeah. I was ahead. just gonna say it, it comes up more. Um, um, it, it, it comes up a lot and it comes up a lot with the wrong ending. Oh yeah. You know? all the time. Uh, especially when you layer in the crowd and the hometown and you know, the difference between uh, winning and not winning. So it, it crossed, I don't know if it crossed my mind. We didn't really debrief. Um, we just sort of, we're going to talk in the middle of the week. It crossed my mind just for a minute, but I always feel that talking about another athlete, kind of hoping for someone's lack of success always seems negative, mm -hmm. um, even though it's absolutely a reality. If you're in second place watching somebody maybe not do something, you are 100% hoping yeah. that you win. You are, like, you don't wish for someone to fail, but you definitely hope to win. Um, but I was fine from the outside party from the commentator you come off immediately negative yeah and that's a fear and i understand like i believe i'm with you i you i think you should be able to say orianna's is back there going oh my god i might win this um but you have to tiptoe a little bit of that line as well so yeah yeah there's landmines everywhere yes for sure I, I am curious to to go back and watch the actual live stream because there in the audience i was sitting in the press area next to next to uh, Albert Oak and at one point when Natalia was was uh, on the wall there the, the seconds were ticking away Albert 
he nudged me and he pointed over and he said, look at Orion. And she was sitting there with her fingers crossed. Right. And like, so it, it's, tr it's tricky. I was kind of curious how that would play on the live stream. And again, I don't know if the live stream, Pete, I don't know if you, you know, noticed that or commented on that at all or not, because it's like, you, you totally understand the mindset of Orion, like her fingers crossed, she wants to win. But at the same time, it's a tricky line, right? You don't want to highlight the fact that she's literally has her fingers crossed, hoping that Natalia is, you know, fails. That's not one. That's one not hand good. was for Orianne. One hand was for Natalia. <laughs> there, it was like perfectly there you go. <laughs> the perfect balance. It's it's a funny thing. I mean, I uh, and this is something that you know I've come to grips with. Uh, watching a competition is fantastic. Watching a competition from. Uh, a 10 by six broadcast monitor is surreal. You miss a lot of the competition because you cannot talk about what's not on the screen of the people at home. So the kiss and cry was in front of us. So we couldn't even lean around and see what was happening just to wait, you know, just to know or to go to the talk back and say, hey, pop it on. Um, you know, some in, the, the girls are chatting or the, the men are chatting, you know, so it was out of our view and you could sort of see it whenever they did the side view. But on our monitor, it's not obvious what's happening. So, I mean, had I noticed on one of those cuts, then maybe would have said something. But you're so isolated from what's actually happening, especially during semis. You have no idea. You have to have the results up all the time. You don't see, you know, you sort of peek around the corner every now and then and be like, oh, I think someone topped something. But you have to talk about the screen. So, yeah, we didn't even really know. Um, we couldn't see her emotions sitting in, in the chair waiting for Natalia to send or not send that boulder. Hmm. All right. Before we go on to the uh, the other headlines, I wanted to uh, just bring up this. This is like I'm going full Zapruder film conspiracy theory on this. But, Pete, you posted something on your Instagram story, which like made me water at the mouth. Uh, this this was uh, Pete's story before semifinals, I think. And this is like super high tech secret IFSC, uh, IFSC statistics technology. Can you tell me a little bit about like what we're looking at here um, and what tools are apparently available to IFSC commentators that the rest of us don't have? Yes, absolutely. And I wanted, I posted, I was like, obviously it's fine. I'm like, I'm, I know a few people that are going to zoom in on this and see what, what it's all about. Uh, the IFSC is collect statistics uh, over all the active competitors that is super, super helpful. So what the screen you're looking at there is, uh, I can't remember who it is. That's uh, Jakob that, Schubert there. Yeah, so that's Jakob's entire uh, open boulder climbing career. And the, the, every point on that graph you can hover over and it'll tell you what comp that was and what place that climber came in. The lines down the side are, I think, one, five, ten. So it's every five. So you can see pretty quickly how many semis they've made at a glance. Um, and you see their, you know, what years they had consistency in. So each of those um, change in tone is a year, a competition year. Um, and then if scrolling down from there, you can sort by rank. You can sort by event. You can sort by all of that. So you can see very, very, very quickly. There's a couple of other frames where you can see... Um, you can filter further down just by year. So you can see single events uh, or single seasons. So you, all of these pieces of the puzzle make it very, very easy to quickly go and get information, which is sometimes useful on the fly, but mostly is useful for the work you do ahead of time. So you're not um, hunting the IFSC page as you would as a normal consumer looking for an athlete and their results. It's just immediately available behind the scenes. And then there are several other screens where there is a head-to-head -head so you can pull up um, as many as you want. It works really well for finals. You can pull up, you know, six athletes and put them beside each other. And the statistics go down to, you heard us say a couple of times, you know, this person sent 50% of their, you know, boulders in all of their finals. So they track problems completed per round. It's amazing. Uh, the first one, everybody pulls up. As soon as you get into the tool, you look up Yanya. Um, and she has done 100% of her qualification boulders and 98% topped. 98% of her semifinal boulders, hmm. which makes it different. So when you're talking uh, on a stream and you say, she's done a lot of them, it sounds like you might have a pretty good idea. And people are like, That's, I suppose it might be impressive. And then you say, 
Clamor has done, has topped 98% of the semifinals boulders, which are consistently the hardest boulders of a competition, then you say, oh my goodness. You know, you, that, it has a little more depth. Do you, know, cool. do you know how far back th those statistics are referring to? Because that was a question uh, a bunch of people had that I was talking to. We weren't sure if it was like just for this season or because uh, most of us aren't that familiar with the top rates of the athletes that were in finals, right? Yanya would be easy to fact check. But um, like, do you know how far those go back? Because my understanding is this is being built by Vertical Life, who have only mm -hmm. been doing it for like, since the start of 2020 so they literally got like one world cup in 2020 uh and when you go before that the the i think the data is technically like controlled by a different guy with digital rock and so do you, do you know like what the what the full database is that it's collecting from we i did not find a climber who i did not have full statistics on all the way back to their youth careers okay so 2000 and i was i was digging down uh, 2009 for some of them and still full, full statistics. Okay. So they, uh, they dug them up from somewhere, uh, but it's everything cool and lead and speed. They have their current, uh, best speed time just sits right on top of their profile. And then you can see their speed events and also combined. There's also a really cool graph that just shows season by season, um, how many of each, um, discipline they attended. So when you layer them all together, you have the graph sort of red is boulder, yellow is lead, purple is speed. Um, and you can see climbers that have done full seasons of combined or just lead and speed, or they had a lead career and then a bouldering career. Um, and it just gives you both of those hard numbers and also just general things to talk about. You know, oh, you know, somebody who started their career in lead and has transitioned into bouldering. It just gives you, you know, knowledge to talk about on a broadcast. Yeah, hopefully this becomes public because there's a bunch of whack jobs like myself and probably Canadian climbing news and a couple other people who have like had to do all this shit by hand. And, you know, I don't have information technology skills. So uh, it would be great if this became public. So I don't have to uh, do it myself, but I'm really glad that exists because like the, the one thing I found from, and I really only scratched the surface with the stuff I've transcribed. You like pick one discipline, pick one gender and just look at 10 years of the, all of the results and you will find a story, right? That you can make mm -hmm. a video out of or that you can mention in commentary or, you know, or it can change your perspective on who's a good climber compared to who else or whatever. And, you know, you, you go in, you just, you go, you dive down like, you know, a foot into this, uh, into this detail and it changes your perspective on different athletes and storylines. And it sucks that more people can't do that. Oh man, statistics are so, I know they're a grind and we get just overloaded with them in football and, and basketball. And some of them are so inane that I don't care that, you know, they've only ever scored three touchdowns on every second Thursday of full moon months. Like, I don't care that when we get to that, but I care about interesting statistics. And if you ever watch these guys, I always forget their name, but there's a, they have a YouTube channel and they do sports statistics and they tell stories, um, based solely on statistical either anomalies or regularities, and they are fascinating. So yeah, it's a bit nerdy, but they tell these incredible stories of rarities in sport that are, in some people's minds, just you know a, a badly told story over breakfast. And as soon as you go back and look at all the numbers and say, that's never happened, followed by that, these four things in a row have never happened. What you guys were talking about last week about um, you, you have an idea of who has done the most World Cup podiums, but it's hard to find all the information in one place to say, wait, is it how many in a row? Is it how many in total um, when we add in World Championships? So I think their statistics are important. Um, I would love for the Canadian Climbing Federation to look into building a database like this because if we're trying to build our nationals commentary, um, it's really, really, you have to go to gripped articles on Facebook, Which is never to not to roast anybody, results. but that is the worst source for like anything, dude. Yeah. <laughs> well, you and I both have this experience of you know, okay, so like whatever, it's it's this nationals or that nationals. Okay, time to do research, and you're like, okay, so I'm going to start with CompSeason.com, which is a privately, you know, or was formerly a privately developed just by a, a, a gym owner, and now it's owned by one of the provinces. And then I have to go and try and find like uh, FQME PDFs from like <laughs> years ago for those other nationals. And then if it was somewhere else, then you just have to like find a Facebook post from the host gym or whatever. So yeah. yeah I, or you text them 
Yo, who won nationals in 2013? Totally. We were like, we had nationals in 2013? Yeah. yeah I, <laughs> I scrolled in once, scrolled in on the trophy, right? Like, whose name is on that? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. All right, let's talk about let's talk about this actual comp, which uh, we alluded to is kind of cool because we've all watched it from a different perspective. John was right there in the front, best seats in the house. Pete could have had the best seats in the house, but instead he was looking at an iPhone screen or whatever you had to watch it through. And I'm in my basement doing it the way I always do, which is fun because you know you get internet culture to to keep you entertained during the during the lulls. But as always, we're going to start with the headlines. Uh, and John, you get to go first. What what is the the New York Times big print across the top from this competition? I thought this was a fantastic comp in the sense that there are a number of headlines that you could choose and make a valid point for being the biggest takeaway. But for me, I have to go with kind of my nationalistic heart and and choose uh, what we were just talking about with Natalia, Natalia Grossman, more specifically for a headline. Um, just a little background. A couple years ago, I think 2019, um, I interviewed Natalia when she was in the midst of her National Cup series sweep. So for those people that are listening outside of the US, they don't know what that is. It's it's basically like a World Cup circuit, but it's at the national level. So there's a there are bouldering events all around the United States. Uh, in 2019, Natalia won every single event. And and then she ended up winning bouldering nationals, uh, the national championships in, in 2020, shortly after that. Um, so when I was interviewing her, I went to my my editor at Climbing Magazine, and I and we were trying to figure out a, a headline, a title for the for the interview, and I said, you know, the the title that makes sense is just to say Natalia Grossman is America's new comp superstar, like that's because that's kind of what this interview is all about. I so I would say I would take that same headline and apply it here to this discussion, to this competition. Although I I might replace America's new competition superstar to saying she's. The global, uh, she's a global superstar now. I, I think um, this was really kind of her coming out party in a sense of of kind of like the the international comp scene. Um, she's got this fantastic pedigree that I just went over, kind of preceding all of this with national cup wins and national championships and 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 even in May at Mayringen recently, you know she she made podium, which was kind of like a nice precursor to this victory. It was kind of like this proof of like, Hey, pay attention to me. You know, I'm going to do big, big things this season, or I'm capable of doing really big things. Um, and so she, she follows up that podium place at Mayringen with winning here. And if you look at how she did it, you know, she was second place after the qualification round, she was first in semifinals by topping everything. Uh, and then she, in the final, she topped all the boulders as well. But even those results don't tell the full story. The full story is is how she topped that final boulder, right? The, the just the on the edge of your seat excitement. Um, and and Tyler, you and I have said before that it just makes such a big difference in the electricity when the person who wins the event is from the the host country, right? That just adds something special to it. And this was one of those instances it's happened before in the United States world cups with Alex Puccio and, and Alex Johnson prior to that and all that. So this was kind of a continuation of, of that. Um, but I just, when I think back to the event now, Natalia Grossman, her win is the big story and, and kind of her, her prominence on the, on the international level. Now I was going to say it's disproportionate how many hometown world cups Americans win. Like at some point, somebody has got to start it testing is. the water. Like it's fuck. like just in bouldering it's so now it's, it's Natalia Grossman. Megan Muscarain is from 2015 was her first one in Vail or was it 16? I can't remember. Uh, Puccio in 2009, um, John, Alex Johnson, 2008. And then Daniel Woods was like, I can't remember like 2010 ish or something like that. So that's five American boulders that win their first World Cups in the States. And most Americans win their World Cups in the States. And nobody else does that. Like, that's weird, man. I think there used to be a perception that the the entirety of the depth didn't travel that's to the U.S. Sure. And then it changed. And then it, and then it became, yeah, they do, because they need the points. So, yeah, of course they're going to go and... and it, that is a it's a myth if you think that you won a comp 
um, you know, but not everyone was there, you know. Uh, yeah, it's, the, in the early days, well, it was kind of true, though. Like, when you look at, like, Alex Johnson's win, you're like, ah, oh, that's a pretty shallow field, man. Like, just not a lot of people showing up. And it doesn't mean much to beat just the entire Canadian team, right? Like, especially 10 <laughs> years ago, that's not a huge accomplishment. But, uh, but yeah, that's that's true. But but it is interesting, too, because it's it's... It doesn't do it justice to just say, oh, Americans always do well because it's in the United States. Well, that doesn't that doesn't really compute because we've seen in other instances where people that are of the host country actually don't do well. Right. In their in their host uh, in their host competition, you know, nerves, anxiety, expectations, whatever you want to say. Um, it, it, it's not always the case that that the people that are from that country do well at that competition. So this is yeah, there is kind of something interestingly unique here. Yeah, I agree. And and I think there's uh you have to look at so many more factors than just uh where are you and are you at home and what happened. It's where is your training at, where is your experience level. You have to layer in all the other things. And um Sean Bailey made an interesting point. I interviewed him after the qualifiers and he said it was weird walking into isolation because it just felt like a training day. He goes to that gym every day. So you are you're you get to sort of wind his brain up and wait and say, wait a minute, this is a World Cup. This isn't just, um, you know, Friday morning at the training center in Salt Lake. So he, there are lots of things at play when you're at home that you might not think about as a casual viewer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, yeah it, well said. American exceptionalism is alive and well down uh, <laughs> down south of the border. Good, <laughs> good job, guys. Uh, yeah, yeah, my my headline for this was uh, so I typed it out just to be a, 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 to be lame, but my headline would be "Climbing Still Shines Without Our Female Tiger Woods." Um, my my biggest worry for this week was that watching bouldering would just suck knowing that Yanya wasn't there and therefore did it really matter like were the problems really hard enough does it matter if you win a world cup when Yanya doesn't show up um what would the like because a lot of the field frankly looks a step below and would that you know still be impressive if you had that dominant force still there um, and it did, and it was, it was partially, we got some, a couple like breakthrough, excellent personalities that really shone through on the broadcast in men's and women's as much as you can make some complaints about, uh, the finals route setting for women, you forget about it by the end of the round. Um, it was close and, uh, and it was hard fought at the end of it. Um, so I was very pleasantly surprised because I was ready to be disappointed and I wasn't the roster going into finals was amazing um the the stories for any of those women winning would have been incredible uh and it was exciting down to the to the very as as we've said to the very last attempt so climate and that's you know people have mentioned to me the the idea of this tiger woods effect which i'm not fully conscious of because you know when i was younger like I, I, when was Tiger Woods first like big win? Like it was in the like late nineties. So I was in late elementary 90s. school, right? So sorry, Pete, uh, but I, I was in elementary school and I remember him being a celebrity, but I didn't watch golf. But when I talk to people who are golf fans, they talk about that as being like a different level of hype and a different level of coverage and golf really benefited from him being there. And apparently has suffered to a certain degree now that that effect has like waned a bit. Um, and some people have mentioned that there might be a, a parallel between someone like Yanya, who maybe just her presence brings a lot of extra viewership and extra hype to things. And maybe that's true, but this competition at least proved that there's still life in it, even without our most dominant athlete uh, of the day. Yeah, I, I think I like that. And I love that my headline is going to be unscathed because I, I, I figured there were some obvious ones, so I let them alone. And I, I looked down the list and I, and I thought, I mean, obviously, Yanni is a big deal. So is Miho. <laughs> so is Petra. Yeah, well, so you... is Shauna, right? So you, you, still have, um, uh, you still have a fight on your hands to beat everybody that knows how to podium um, and still be fighting against when Yanni is there. So I, I still think that there was enough. I know I, the Yanya factor is there, but you know, I, the Miho factor is there. <laughs> well, the Miho thing is the Miho and Shauna thing. I think of as somewhat parallel. First of all, Petra, I don't, she's a, she's a high level competitor, but she isn't a star in my opinion. Like I, I don't think of her as like the, the highest 
tier competitor, although she is one of the very few remaining athletes on the scene that has won a bouldering World Cup, albeit just one. Um, but so if Akio and Yanya don't show up, then you just have Petra, Shauna, and Miho, who have won World Cups before. Shauna has had a really rough couple years, and she was coming back into it, hoping things went well. Miho, kind of the same thing, right? Like Miho has gone through some struggles, although she was more present in the last season than Shauna was. Um, uh, and of course, Shauna had a terrible day, and and nobody watches qualifiers, right? And I, uh, Petra had a, had a bad day too. So I liked that Miho was there representing that cohort, right? Although she's only like two years younger than Yanya. So it's more, it makes more sense to think of her as like a Yanya age person than the others. But she's she's mm-hmm. not on the same level. Miho's won like four World Cups or something like that. So I think, of her, well, she's won a shit ton of silver medals, unbelievably. Her silver streak matches basically Yanya's gold streak. But yes, it it's, does. you know, it's not the same thing. So I'm glad Miho was there to... to um, make the make the new athletes fight and say like I'm not letting you into this club of gold medal boulderers without you beating me. So I, I am glad she was there. I, I think Agreed. the difference, a little bit of a difference between the Tiger Woods scenario, or even uh, another sport example, that would be Lance Armstrong, right? When he was winning all these Tour de France's, like cycling in the United States, presumably in you know elsewhere in North America, it just like everybody was like into cycling just because of him pretty much. Right. Um, and, and the, the differences with Yanya is I think cl- climbing's popularity is not solely she, Yanya is not carrying the, the weight on her shoulders entirely right now. I think a lot of it is also due to the Olympics. Um, and, and of course Yanya is kind of woven into that as well, but take Yanya away from the Olympics. And I still think there would be all this hype around climbing popularity around it and because of the olympics we have all of these other competitors who are stars as well um you know miho for example shauna as you just mentioned but uh, i so i I just kind of feel like it's a little different different than tiger woods uh, or lance armstrong or any of those other instances because there is also that olympic cachet that is helping uh propel this interest in climbing right now that's fair that's fair I, i agree too and and i think there's so much when you consider the split between competition and climbing and outdoor climbing is different than so many other sports. The competition in golf is still on a golf course and competition in cycling is still on a bike outside. And we are in a rare place where our competitions are in, in, in most cases, an entirely different world from the people that are elite rock climbers. So there's enough rock climbing interest that competition climbing, you know, shares the spotlight. And there are, I promise you, there are people who would not know who she is, um, who just, you know, just follow climbing media, even they just go climbing. So I think we have that split that most other sports don't really get to hang on to. That's fair. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Pete, what about you? What's your headline for the event? I mean, my headline is that, you know, young guns came to play. The future is bright for competition climbing. You, you had the, probably the youngest average age of any finals in recent memory. Uh, Oriane Breton is 16. Mejdi is 17. That's crazy to come out that composed in your first couple of World Cups and just absolutely... We talked about Mejdi um, on the broadcast standing in front of his first finals boulder, which was... Like, I love it when the root setters kind of just decide what boulder you get first. And it was a uh, not super complex, but just careful enough half step across a couple of volumes um, that you watched Jakob just overcook, mm-hmm. like over and over and over again. He just like ran way too hard, too much power. And we're like, is he going to control the nerves and the adrenaline? Is he just going to come springing off the wall? And uh, he, dialed, he did not look nervous. He didn't look nervous. On any boulder, he just climbed the way you expected to see someone who's been in, you know, a dozen World Cup finals walk up to a boulder and go, yeah, absolutely, I'm going to climb that. Um, If you hadn't, if you didn't know, you would not have known that that was his first World Cup final uh, and that he was 17. And the same goes for Oriane um, and the Americans. That you you wouldn't have known, and that's I think that was a, a really 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 important point is that they came out and really showed composure and climbed with the strategy and the savvy of veterans 
maybe due to some really strong youth careers, but I still don't think you can compare, you know, your last youth World Cup to your first Open Boulder finals. I, I agree on the Mejdi thing in, in regards to his age, like especially like for women, we're, we're starting to get used to younger athletes. But for the men, it is like, you know, last year seeing Alberto Hines Lopez show up was like a breath of fresh air. Um, seeing him show up in finals and same thing now with this Mejdi kid who I thought like when we saw him in Brienne Son, I think he was in the lead final or maybe he was just in the semis oh and I actually have it here and this was his athlete like you know uh, like a uh, um, <laughs> video image where he's just doing this like complete meme of a of a video thank you to uh, Abrar in the discord who isolated this uh, and shared it um, I was like okay I'm never gonna see this kid again like he just had the luckiest day of his life He's in his yeah. own country. It's the weirdest World Cup we've ever seen because it's COVID and nobody's here. Um, pleasantly surprised. And, of course, the personality and attitude that he showed later was uh, was sick. Um, so, yeah, good uh, good, good call with, uh, with that. So, yeah, it's, it's cool. You know, uh, you guys mentioned uh, the way he was interacting with Jakob um, on the uh, – what you, what you called the, the kiss and cry, like the kind of the, where you just sit after you're done competing and – it, it it's not something we see from the men ever. You see it with the women all the time. Um, the women's field gets to know each other so much better. They see each other more often and they are all younger. And, you know, when, when new athletes come in, they, they, they get taken under those wings fairly quickly. But with the men, it's, it's like the men is, is like often feels like an old boys club. Like, Hey, we all competed together at the like 2007 world youth championship. Right? <laughs> and who are like you? it's the, it's the, yeah, it's the same guys still sometimes. Um, so yeah, it, 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 well, that is a really good point. Yeah. And, and Megan and I mentioned it when Jakob came off his last boulder, he, the first thing he did was come over and to Mejdi and just be like, yo, you killed it. Mm -hmm. Um, and as, as, and the same thing, Megan said, the women are just, um, we joke, they're not nicer. They're just, uh, they interact differently. Um, and they support each other differently. Um, in those, in between those stages through the competition and the, the happiness for someone else's success is, uh, more apparent. So more emotionally obvious, not that they care, not that they're different than the men who are the men who are like, I absolutely just want to crush people and hope that they all fall off, but they don't like smile and cry and hug each other the same as the women do. So you, you sort of forget that the men do care. And I talked to Jakob a little bit after and I said, when did you first realize this kid was going to be something? And he said, well, you said, he's like, we saw him in Brian I was like, yeah, that kid's pretty good. I wonder when we're going to see him again. And then he just, he just looked at me and went, here he is. Yeah. I, I think that caught me by surprise, too. I mean, we saw him in Brian Son, but even last, the, the most recent, you know, World Cup at Meiringen, um, I think Mage D ended up like 12th or something like that. Mm -hmm. so Somewhere in semis, yeah. Nowhere near what you would expect. Um, like the the jump from going 12th to, to you know, like almost winning um, in, in here in Salt Lake, like that just took me totally by surprise. Um, even if you saw him at Mayringen and you thought, oh, this kid, you know, he, he should make some finals maybe this year. Like I don't think anybody would have expected that so quickly he would have kind of gone to the front of the line. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. men's field was deep this weekend. The, we weren't missing a lot. We were missing the Koreans, and that's about it. The rest of that field has podiumed World Cups. I mean, I think everybody in the semifinal almost has podiumed a World Cup. Like, the men's field was super, super deep. So to fight your way through that and earn those... Um, those spots through each of those rounds, there's no fluke. You might fluke your way into a semi. You might even fluke your way into a finals once, but you don't fluke your way to a podium. You yeah, just don't. Right. <laughs> All right, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna talk about like the big winners uh, from this event, and as, as it usually is, we've normally covered them in the headlines. So we'll we'll kind of like give our, our our actual winners. But if you want to add like an honorable mention. Uh, feel free. So I'm going first on this one. The big winner is Natalia Grossman. Um, I think that basically how often are you going to be given an opportunity where the best boulder, you know, that we've seen in a long time, isn't going to be at a world cup and neither is the second best. Somebody was going to seize that opportunity. Natalia did a great job. You know, it, her name can, you know, that could be the only gold medal you win. Like look at a lot of American bouldering uh, stars. A lot of them just have the one, right? Um, so this could be the end of it. 
hopefully it isn't. And I hope that she and, uh, and Brooke and all these folks stay on the scene and compete regularly, which is hopefully going to be the, the, uh, trajectory for American climbers going forward is not just, you know, one or two world cups here. Hopefully it's all of them. Um, but she sees the opportunity and she got it. And now it's getting to see if she can, uh, really play with, with people like Yanya and Akio before Akio retires. Um, but she was really fun to watch. And, uh, I, I think she, you know, she had the most to win just like all those other girls, but she's the one that, uh, that took it. And, um, uh, I'm very, uh, very happy for her. Um, just to add a, uh, uh, I've got a bunch of like random notes that I wanted to make sure I throw in here at some point. Um, so my other winner is going to be anybody that tuned in after the start of men's stream. Um, for, for you guys, I, Pete, you may have heard about it. John, you may have seen it too. Um, there, there was just like, guess what? You're broadcasting a stream on the internet. There are some trolls and sometimes they say stuff that is not super cool. Um, and the IFSC doesn't have like a chat cooldown, so you can just keep keep on spamming stuff nonstop, right? I don't think I saw the IFSC having any mods at Maringen, but they certainly didn't have any here through the women's half. And some of it was pretty gross, but if you're, you know, internet savvy, you understand that like that's what you get with the internet if you don't have somebody on standby to uh to click heads and uh, knock these people out of the chat. So anyway, IFSC like deputized, at least what it looked like is the IFSC account came in and just randomly started deputizing people in the chat as mods, just handing the ban hammer to random folks. And that's super weird. And they're going to have to like come up with probably a set of rules and guidelines for their mods because it's a lot of power for people that you've never met before <laughs> but it instantly fixed the problem like you know the stuff that the the trolley shit was extremely obvious and easy easy to ban and get out of the way um so they did their job they did a good job um i hope the the ifsc broadcast guys build a set of guidelines for moderators and i probably care about this more than most people but when you give people power on the internet sometimes they start doing dumb shit so let's make a clear set of guidelines of what's acceptable and what's not. Moderators, it's not their job to end arguments, right? Like it's not it's not your job to 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 make two different people like each other. It's just to get rid of the most egregious shit. So if somebody comes in, says one thing about a, a particular geopolitical struggle in the chat, that's not something you need to delete or argue with. And if two people start arguing, if it starts like filling the chat, you don't have to try and like make world peace between these two people. You just start deleting any extra comments. So figure out your guidelines. Um, but it was a huge fix. Um, and it, it just shows like the simple steps that the IFSC can take to, uh, to make big changes. Um, I would also recommend they just turn on the slow chat filter in YouTube. So you can't post like, instantly after every message like there's nobody in ifsc chat that has a publishable good thought every five seconds none of you are that big brain on climbing so one post like every half minute is totally okay but anyway huge win that the ifsc stepped in at all um it made a huge difference so if you tuned in for the men's half rather than the women's half um it actually looked respectable. It looked like a well-moderated chat for a minute there. So good job um, to the people who uh, who got the got the mod badge, probably without any qualifications. And good job to whoever at the IFSC you know decided to do that. So thumbs up, big winner. Um, who's next? Uh, uh, Pete, you're 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 second for uh, for big winner of the week. Um, and I, uh, I also, I wrote, I, I also wrote some notes as soon as you told me what's going on and I have biggest winner and then just a lot of white space, uh, <laughs> because I just wasn't sure what you, I wasn't sure what we, what was going to come up and that I didn't want to be overly obvious. Um, but I, I mean, I just, without being the youngsters, were the biggest winner, you know. Um, I I just think that Meshdi, I mean, he, he chased Adam Andra through three rounds like he was, you know, um, in his home gym with his crew. And I think that uh, you see a lot of people make weird mistakes. You see a lot of people, a lot of veterans climb poorly in a round. Um, anybody that walked out, anybody that watched semifinal boulder number one uh and just watched you know 19 of the world's best climbers get dealt 
uh, an absolute slap in the face yeah. right out of ISO. Um, and to not have that demoralize you, you know, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, it takes a veteran. I talked to Jakob a little bit after it and I said, you know, great finish, like unbelievable. He said, yeah, I started in the bottom. And he said he went back into secondary ISO and thought these people who don't know me are going to think I'm a terrible climber and I can't have that. Uh, so I, I just dialed it up. Um, but that's like 15 years of experience. Like Jakob has got 60 some podiums over his career and he was able to just shake off that first boulder and go, yeah, no problem. I got this. Um, this is a, a literal child. Um, and I think that he, you know, without doing the obvious sort, and you know, you've taken Natalia out and, and without sort of, you know, playing that story any longer, I think that Mejdi is the big winner. I think that he signaled if he can keep this up to go first comp, semifinal, second comp podium um, behind the likes of Adam Andrea, uh, that's a big win. Aside from his results, uh, just really quickly to say that the way he climbed and the way he expressed himself made him a ton of fans. Uh, you, you know, people would ask, like, who's the commentator or who is, uh, you know, who is this climber? But a lot of people were asking, like, who is this guy? I like this person just off of their impressions from how he performed. So, yeah, even if not, you know, a gold medal on the podium, uh, he earned a lot of recognition um, that uh, that hopefully he can uh, um, profit off of in whatever way. I, I, I think you, you can. Could... Yeah, please. Go ahead, John. Well, I was, I was just going to say, have you know, ever seen somebody I, come down and spike their chalk bag after topping a boulder in happiness? Like, have you ever seen that? Yeah, I think I have, but that but that one was uh, he he went out he really went after it, eh? <laughs> and actually, I wanted to give a shout out because I know that's time. Yeah, he I know um, uh, 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 Daniel Gajda, the the photographer, one of uh, either the official or one of the official photographers there. I know in the last episode, Eddie kind of roasted him on the way out, and I I doubt he was happy about that criticism he got, but the the uh the burst capture that daniel caught and then put together uh and put a little music on it like that is that's the kind of little memento of a moment that's going to live for a really long time um and uh i i I thought that like you know i haven't seen all the photos from the event but i thought that was a great piece of uh of memorabilia daniel did a great job with that and that's the kind of thing where just you you get new people doing stuff and you get new kinds of products and so um i think daniel seized on that and first of all got the great shots but then also produced it and shared it in a way that i think is going to resonate with a lot of viewers um so so good work for that particular uh, string of shots of his uh of his chalk bag tantrum after that uh, after that top yeah, it was one of those things where as I was watching it happen, I was thinking, please, I hope that a photographer got a good shot of this because yeah. it was a, a, certainly an iconic moment from this competition. And Daniel did a phenomenal photo. I, so, yeah, I agree with 100 percent with that. And, and I'll just add to what you said, Pete, about the youngsters. I think you could even pan out. Maybe you would say that that Mejdi and Orion were kind of the anchors. But I think Team France had a phenomenal showing in the sense of okay you have Mejdi and Orion getting second you know second place respectively but then below the results you know Fanny was ninth Mikhail Mawem was 10th I think Manuel Cornu was like in the 30s at some point down there that is what you want right you want to have your Olympians and kind of your veterans somewhere in the mix but I think at this stage 2021 with the 2024 Olympics you know, on the horizon, you want to have the youngsters uh, uh, doing really well, making finals, right? To kind of prove that that your national team will not be finished after these veterans or after these 2020, 2021 Olympics. Like, you want to start planting those seeds now and showcasing, okay, we have the veterans, but we also have these young people who who are making waves and are and are you know already becoming these kind of next generation Olympic hopefuls. I France did a phenomenal job of that. We ha, we've seen a couple other countries do that. Like I know last last time in in Meiringen, um, Slovenia. You know Vita Lukin um, was in the finals, 20 years old. Uh, I think um, who was it? Soda Amagasa was was in the finals as well. Kind of these youngsters that are just saying, hey, here we are. Like we have this team of veterans, but there's also us and you better pay attention to us because we are going to be the ones that are going to be on the scene for the next few years and certainly vying for, for uh, 2024 Olympics. So, so 
you know, a tip of the hat to Team France for doing that and Slovenia and Japan for doing that as well. I think all the other countries, you know, frankly need to should follow suit. That's that's the, that's the ideal. France in particular, I think, is a is a huge one, not only because they're hosting the 2024 Olympics, but like France is known as a great climbing country. But from the competition side, for the most part, you say that with a glance back into history at this point, right? Like, you know, and it's it's almost kind of the same with Austria sometimes, too. Like you look after Jakob and you're kind of like, you know, Jesse Pills is a great climber, but it's not like she's, you know, she's she lives, unfortunately, under the shadow of someone like Yanya Garnbrett. But these are countries that were like dominant countries and they kind of just like fall by the wayside. And you don't see as much of their up and coming talent as you see with Japan, obviously. And Slovenia does a good job, too. You always see that crew of uh, of men and women. But for France to start lining up people like Oriane and Mejdi now with like a couple of years lead up to their home Olympics you can kind of start talking about France in the present tense again, which is kind of nice because, you know, after, you know, Romain de Grange left, I think what Manu Cornu won a world cup somewhere recently as well. But like, you know, France is kind of a historical contributor, but now they might actually be back in the present. So I'm, I'm psyched. And and that's the ideal template, right? Like oh, you yeah. phrase it really well, line up the uh, line them up now. Like now is the time to start lining up these young people that are going to be vying for 2024. Uh, mm -hmm. so john headline or not headline uh, uh what's your what's your we basically cherry picked all the easy stuff so so who's uh who's your winner and you can't well, say the french federation because i just stole that story <laughs> from you <laughs> there's one there's one big winner that i'm surprised we haven't really uh dwelled on or mentioned yet which is adam andra um okay you, you know um okay. he's he's had I, th I think he's kind of been overshadowed in in some ways because maybe because of Natalia's oh that guy right? <laughs> like um natalia had this awesome win you know these youngsters are doing you know they're rocking and rolling it's it's kind of like it's weird to say but adam andra is he's kind of like slipped under the radar a little bit that all of a sudden he's had the ideal start to a world cup bouldering season right first place in Meiringen, first place here in, in Salt Lake City. Um, that's better than he, I looked back at his results from 2019. Uh, he started the season there, he won at Meiringen, and then he got second place in Moscow, which was the follow-up uh, in 2019. So he's he's had a better start than 2019, two in a row. Um, <laughs> and this year he might actually show up to all the World Cups, which he, you know, didn't do last time. Uh, yeah, he's. I know he's registered for the next Salt Lake uh Hopefully we get to watch him climb speed, which will be amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, no, that's a really fair point. And let's talk about that because like just just judging by the, the YouTube chat, which I'm very glad is here because it gives you a sense of like what the regular viewer is thinking of. Adam Andra is the greatest of all time to these people. And he may be the greatest climber of all time. That's totally fair. But there's a lot of hype around uh, people that follow climbing in general. Why is it that me somebody that follows a lot of competition climbing especially in bouldering isn't that hyped about him and it's like he's not like in men's it's so hard to be a dominant boulderer and adam andra frankly is not like the prototypical modern boulderer right like i if i'm looking for a streak i'm kind of expecting it from somebody like tomo and arasaki i feel like he is the you know he is the um the, the forefront of this scene right now so I get psyched when Andre is at lead world cups because you get to see the art of just how his body adapts to these huge long roots and just the creativity of, of, of this, like these long struggles. Whereas with bouldering, I'm just not as psyched about it. Why is that? I don't know. Does, does anybody else feel the same way? Let, let me show you something. I don't know if, how well this will come across. Are you but telling that's... me you've got access to this on your phone too? God, I do. So if, if you look at those graphs, the mm -hmm. top, the top line is every Boulder event of the season, and right. the bottom, uh, you probably can't see the numbers, is one. So right. every event, one event, one event, every event, two events, one event, every event, one event. Yeah. He is inconsistent on the Boulder circuit. So he doesn't, you keep him, but then you look and you go, 17 podiums. Yeah. Well, the thing about Adam Seven is medals. he's always been inconsistent with his attendance, too. Like, he's mm -hmm. he's done those things where he competes for a season and then he fucks right off for another season. And you forget exactly. that he exists because he's in some exactly. cave somewhere working on a heel hook until he's, like, bleeding. Like, you know, which to some people is extremely exciting, but to me, I don't care about. Um, exactly. So, yeah, his his history is one of those ones where 
you know, it's it's pretty easy to look at Yanya's record where she's pretty much shown up for everything. And you can judge her on her life's work because she showed up. Whereas Adam, when you go back to Judge Adam, you have these huge gaps where you say, was he as good? Well, he just didn't show up. So how 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 are we going to like process this? I think John wins. That's that's how was the sleeper obvious winner was the back-to-back gold medalist who only comes to competitions when he's in the mood for it <laughs> and still looks excited to win, to top a boulder and win as if it was his first. So we we mentioned that too. You're like, you would think by the time you've got, you know, seven gold medals and 17 photos, you'd be like, heck yes, I'm good at this. But he looks like a kid in mm-hmm. a candy store who's just gotten away with something um, every time he tops a boulder. It's fantastic. He doesn't have that, um, a lot of, People, you have to have confidence, right? It's that classic, where's the line between confidence, overconfidence, and ego. But you get to be able to say, let's up that boulder and walk off. Because if you look too excited, it looks like you weren't expecting to top a boulder. And that's maybe not good for your internal process. And Adam Andre just looks excited to top boulders. It's like he couldn't be happier every time he goes climbing. And I think that's refreshing and good for the sport. So, I, John, that's a... The sleeper obvious choice, I think it's a really good one. I, I do wonder, too, if he would reflect back on kind of those competitions that he didn't take part in, the seasons that he didn't, you know, give it the full the full participation and all that. I, I don't know. I wonder if he kind of regrets maybe that that might be the wrong word because obviously he's built a phenomenal career nonetheless but but i wonder if he had to do it over again if he would choose to maybe be a little more consistent on the competition scene um just gauging that just by seeing how much fun he seems to be having now i I, i'd be curious to hear i I doubt it's an interesting point like i because i i like you know so much of his is his reputation is from his outdoor stuff right like he's he's I, I don't think he, and it's it's depressing for me because I would way rather he just comes on the circuit every year. Like that's that's like I haven't watched the silence video. Like I'm sure it's cool. Enjoy it. But it's like it's just not I, I don't care. But when you see that boulder, I, what was it? Men's three where you had the the upside down uh, uh, heel hook beta and the chat's just going off with people like, oh, this is silence. This is silence. It's like, you know, there's people that love all parts of climbing. And Adam has, you know, taken advantage of all of that. Nobody's going to watch him, you know, go outside and like do some dyno and be like, yo, it's like the, the, the Maringen M M one, like, you know, outdoor climb, like people don't remember or resonate with indoor climbing as much as they do as that big outdoor stuff. So I doubt he regrets it. Although I wish he felt differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, the, the hard stuff, the biggest, well, then I, I will say Tyler real go quick. Ahead. I just wanted to say that that was another thing that I said could be the winner was fans of crack climbing you know we you and i said the, the classic week, fallback the big winner this week is the climbing community well it was it was <laughs> neat because you and i said during may ring in we said ah this the the hand jam stuff it's starting to feel a little bit like a forced gimmick right it's like we don't really need we don't need to have a, a hand jam every single may ring in comp um just to have one and and so I was pleasantly surprised. I don't think anybody was expecting like a heel toe cam, um, and and they did a really good job. The route setters did a really good job of forcing it, right? Because we saw people like uh, Andre Pehar like try to break the beta and couldn't really do it. Like you really needed to to do it as a as a heel toe cam, um, and and so I, I, yeah, I, I'm sure that there were a lot of people that were just kind of thrilled. It was a nice surprise. You you might see hand jams in competition. You very rarely see you know, toe cams, especially ones where you can't break the beta, like you have to jam your, your foot in there. Um, so that was, that was cool. Um, before we move on to the loser thing, I, I'm going to raise your hand if your loser is the root setters. I just want to make sure I'm not blowing anybody. No. Okay. So let's talk about it while we're here. Um, and I, I mentioned these specifically because Pete and Megan, you guys seem to, uh, have gotten some good access to the root setters and learned about what the beta was on a lot of these problems. And it seemed like on a bunch of them, it didn't go the way the root setters expected. Um, and on top of that, you had some problems that frankly weren't effective uh, in semifinals and finals at providing any separation or entertainment value. Um, maybe we'll just focus specifically on the on the beta thing, but could, could you give any insight on 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 uh, how you felt the the root setters' intentions uh, ended up playing out, I I think it's it's always hard. And I am, if you've 
ever listened to me on a broadcast before, I am very, very pro root setter and very, very pro um, root setting knowledge because mostly because it's the only sport in the world in which you create an environment to compete on every single time. And the people that create that environment need to be held up um, as a huge part of the success of an event. Um, and they get a lot of, like anything, um, as soon as one tiny little thing goes apparently wrong, they get a lot of vitriol in the community. Um, and I've spent enough time around world-class root setters to understand their process and, and to know that if one boulder doesn't go well, but you still get great separation, there were no ties. There was one tie, I think, uh, ties for 12th going, you know, into in semifinals or something. Um, so although some of the boulders looked too hard, and some of the boulders we called it, you know, the you know, did you top boulder number three club in the semifinal for the women? I think I lost you guys. We've got you back. Okay. Um, I think that there was a couple of boulders that didn't climb as hard as they were set. And we watched them floor running like that boulder is going to be nails. Uh, and the, they didn't underestimate that women just climbed brilliantly. The mantle was possibly too easy. It could have stolen some attempts um, just kind of figuring out how to fit that body position. It stole some attempts on a few people, but everybody figured it out. Um, and remember that root setters are okay with people topping boulders. We still got you. We still got you. We still okay. Um, We're just emotionless. (laughs) We're waiting when you're done. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, And it's okay to have tops, and it's okay to have flashes. Um, It's okay for the best climbers to climb well on boulders. So um, I think that barring a couple of beta breaks, um, the boulder number three, um, which wasn't supposed to be a compression boulder in the finals. they did as a compression boulder. There was some really cool kind of beta that, you know, could have worked out. But other than that, um, I thought the root setting was fantastic. And I thought it created an interesting movement. I thought it created risk. Um, there was a shocking amount of tiny feet, uh, a shocking amount of dual text to force movement. I thought boulder number one in the men's final uh, was an absolute gem. Um, just the way it forced movement at the top. Uh, so I, I really thought the root setting was, was good. And, and because I looked past the one boulder that everybody focused on. They're like, everybody topped the boulder. The root setting was terrible. I'm like, no, that's fine. You know, that's one tiny miscalculation where you thought a few more people would fall on their way to a top. That's fair. And another thing to add, just to praise the root setters, is they did all this without, um, you know, without any steep walls, really. Uh, and I know that that was kind of an issue that was was being discussed and whatnot. Um, and I'm, I'm not as familiar with like the backstory behind it and, and all that. But I'll just say that, you know, I was talking to, to Daniel Gajda who said, he said, I think the steepest wall in terms of the whole plane of the wall, the entire thing was 20 degrees. That was the steepest. I think there was a wall that was 30 degrees overhang, um, but it just for the lower section. And then it, and then it kind of um, got more, more vertical, um, you know, so to do all this route setting to have all this separation with something that essentially is not any steeper than 20 degrees, right? There were no caves. There was no, um, you know, no like flashy, hangy 360 moves, nothing like that. Um, that just adds to the, the, you know, props for the route setters. Yeah. Did anybody mm-hmm. get like actual confirmation on that rumor that a, like the wall didn't arrive because a lot of people were just repeating stuff that they heard from other people saying, Oh yeah. Like one of these walls didn't actually show up. And so the rumor was that, entrepreneurs messed up and didn't deliver what the event expected um anybody because i i asked a few people i didn't get any confirmation from anyone that mattered so what did you hear pete i talked to um the one of the head designers of ep directly who came to the event with the wall uh and the wall that you saw was as designed as modified signed off on delivered so it was absolutely the angles. Um, and I talked to Jamie Cassidy, who's the chief. He's chiefing next weekend as well. Uh, I said, what did you think when you came and saw the walls? And he was like, they're great. Yeah. Like this is, they set, you know, he's like, and we, went, we sort of talked about that again, about uh, semifinal men's number one, that, I mean, those holds are beautiful. Those dual text wood and, and friction, um, that little slab traverse climb. And he said, it's rock climbing. So did you put any slab climber on that and they're going to send it. So 
climb setting you know you know shallower angles um makes climbers get on their feet um and modern bouldering has a mixture of power control compression coordination and when you need to slow a uh, competition climber down and make them move slowly and think there's a whole other element that people forget about the casual viewer at home thinks it's about come out guns a blazing you know how much energy are you going to spend you need to think about how much clock are you going to spend if you got a boulder that's a 40 second a traverse attempt how many tries are you going to get in yeah. four minutes you know especially if you have to stop and think about it and if you're on a boulder for a minute you know anywhere between 40 seconds and i mean that's now you're you're stealing a different piece of strategy which is calm down use your feet don't think about how long you're on this boulder because if you fall you're running out of time to do another one you're not tired and you still can't do it i love that i love the subtleties of getting in a competitor's head because you need to you can't just throw smaller steeper holds at these climbers they'll just climb the boulders yeah my my, my final comments on the wall first of all i I am surprised that I didn't hear anything from the USA climbing people that I reached out to, because in my opinion, if Entrepreneurs delivered the wall that you wanted, you would be supporting your biggest, like one of your biggest sponsors. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit confused why they didn't get back and just say, no, this isn't true. You know, EP does a great job, blah, blah, blah. So that was kind of weird, but I'm glad it sounds like that wasn't actually the case. Although... I haven't heard anything from USA Climbing. Uh, the other thing I just mentioned about the wall design itself, like if somebody asked for like a modern bouldering wall, that was it. Like that was a great wall. I just miss the fact that, you know, the classic veil walls of, of days past were sometimes had some of the steepest angles of the entire circuit. And I'm an advocate for locations having a signature like style or feature. And it did feel like we gave that away. Um, so it's it's disappointing in one regard, but it's also just like it's it's just as good as everything else on the circuit probably. So I, I, I don't, I'm not really complaining. Isn't that kind of nice, Tyler, to add to the surprise too? Like that's part oh, of yeah. the fun, right? It's like as soon as as soon as competitors get in their head, okay, every time we go to the U.S., it's going to be steep. There's going to be caves, and then we yeah. get here and like, what do you know? There's no, there's nothing like that. Like that's yeah. that's great. That's comp climbing. That's the big question mark. Um, you want those kind of little surprises. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's talk about uh, uh, biggest losers from from this weekend, uh, Pete. Because you're still employed by the IFSC for at least another week, you get to go first. What uh, what, what do you have for us? I uh, I gave it some thought for sure, and I kind of thought through the entire event. And I think if you're going to look objectively at the whole thing, in this instance, the biggest loser, I think, is the Japanese team. So when you think historically about the success of you know the Japanese climbers, they are consistently all over, you know, all up in the top. When you look at the numbers, they were one th first, third, ninth, and eighteenth. <laughs> one, th I've created a word. <laughs> Sorry, you reminded me on the. I don't know if it's still there, but on the IFSC like updated results page, uh, any number that ends in a three has the suffix rd as if they're all third, but that doesn't make sense when you're at thirteen. Um, so like, there's all these results that are just like you read it as third third. Uh, but anyway, you just reminded me of that. Let's move on. All right, so they're first, third, ninth, and 18th going into semis. Yoshiyuki goes one first to 16th, and all three of them get zero tops. So only Kokoro makes the final and then comes one spot off the podium. Mm -hmm. So that's, you have your best climbers first, third, and ninth. And then you end up with no one on the podium. I think that's got to be heartbreaking for the Japanese team. Zero, when is the last time you saw three Japanese climber go zero tops in the semifinal? Well, the one thing I noticed watching it was it was weird to not like, because normally you look at the men's and the women's field and you have generally the Europeans conferring on the beta in preview and the Japanese climbers conferring in beta. But in this case, Kokoro Fuji was just like standing there like by himself you know, having nobody else to, to chat with, which is, and it made me realize it's yeah. been a long time since, or at least it feels like it's been a long time since you've seen just one Japanese yeah. climber in a finals per agenda. Right. And I think Yoshiyuki, who I've seen uh, climb, you know, a lot before and then saw in Montreal in person, he's so explosive and so good and so strong. I was absolutely floored to watch his semifinal just mm -hmm. 
disappear into a, a disappointing statistic of first to 16th. I mean, so that's got to hurt. And I think his Instagram story, he was like, you know, didn't climb well, didn't have it. Yeah, I was, it was fascinating because even down to that last problem, you know, I think he was sitting 17th when he started problem four with that one problem. And I think maybe not even with, or anyway, with that one problem, he could have gone from 17th to third or something like that. Mm -hmm. And and that kind of speaks to the kind of round it was where there weren't a lot of tops for men, Mm -hmm. but you know, it seemed like he had the chance the whole time and it just, it never came through. It was kind of disappointing. That's a, that's a great argument for the Japanese team. I didn't actually consider that one. So good, good call. And you, you have to wonder how much the travel played into that. Um, you know, I mean, the Japanese have done well in the United States before, so so you can't say anything definitively. But, but you know, in terms of uh, travel time, travel distance, uh, the Japanese, you know, they had the longest plane flight, uh, frankly. That's like, you know, whatever, 14 hours or something like that. That That's, uh, you know, that's um, some serious jet lag. And, and so you maybe that played into it. You just don't know. That's kind of the X factor. Yeah, maybe. Uh, John, for what sure. about you for uh, for Biggest Loser? So, Tyler, you and I always say that we cannot judge a comp by who, by what it is not. Or we cannot judge a comp by who wasn't there. We have to judge a comp by who was there, right? But I'm going to make an exception this time. I'm going to kind of break our rule. I'm going to say my biggest loser is Yanya Garnbrett. Um, because she loses her streak, her bouldering World Cup victory streak. She loses it without actually losing the competition, right? Like, I keep thinking there's this phrase, if you follow other sports, there's a phrase in combat sports, uh, boxing, MMA, where you have to beat the man, or in this case, the woman, you have to beat the man, to to be the man, you have to beat the man, right? Well, nobody actually beat Yanya, (laughs) and yet yet her streak is over. Um, So I just can't help but, like, stop thinking about that. I, I wish... Oh, if only we could be a fly on the wall to kind of be in Slovenia and 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 watch Yanya watching this and and see kind of what she was thinking as she watched Natalia, um, you know, win the gold. If anything, if there's a silver lining from it, it just sets up this phenomenal showdown for for when Yanya arrives, you know, next week because at Meiringen, Yanya wins, but Orion and Natalia are right there, kind of at her heels. And then here at Salt Lake, Orion and Natalia proved like, okay, well, if Yanya, if you're not here, like we're absolutely going to step up and and sort of be in in your spot. Um, so now all the tr- all the like ingredients are in place to have Yanya here, um, back to attack against Orion and Natalia. It's just going to be awesome to get them all uh, kind of in the ring together, so to speak, to use the the combat sports metaphor. Yanni was my first shout as well. Um, and and it's hard, kind of hard to say because I think we all understand why she didn't show up, even though we don't sure. know the actual reason. We understand it's generally preparation for, you know, her target, which is the Olympics. So it feels weird to say that, you know, it's a loser position because obviously she's fighting for what she considers to be the biggest win on the table for her. But I'm 100% with you because when, you know, when we go back to judge the strength of, of her career, I'm not going to judge how good a climber she is based on whether or not she wins the Olympics, right? Especially these Olympics. Like this doesn't tell us anything about your climbing. Like, first of all, we would never judge anybody off a single event, but we're definitely not going to judge it off like basically a math quiz of a climbing competition. Like it, it is kind of nuts. So it's a nice decoration and it will probably have like huge benefits for her financially and, you know, in the public. So that's great. But nothing would like who who knows how long this streak could have gone like it like knowing her you could sweep this season as well based on what we saw in Maringen. it's unreal and i just wish you know i for my own interests obviously i wish she had just kept coming to all of these and just dragged that thing out as long as she could because she is like she's already written history this is the longest continuous streak of any discipline that we've ever seen so far but imagine that goes like past 10 wins imagine it goes to two seasons in a row like sweeping that that could be incredible and now it is you know now we have to start over again but and that's that's the other thing to mention is it doesn't look like she's slowing down Angie Eider, who is, you know, probably the the other name in contention for greatest competition climber of all time. She won seven World Cups and a world championship in a row, which is the streak that Yanya just broke. 
But then the next World Cup, Angie Eider came second to Maya Vidmar in like Shanghai 2005, came back to the next one and won another seven back to back, right? And so as much as you're like, damn, I really wish she won that single World Cup, you know, that ultimately her, her, her dynasty isn't over yet. So I just really hope that Yanya comes back and kicks ass for another like five seasons. I, I think it's an interesting point. And I do like that you guys brought that up um, because it, as you're talking about it, it occurs to me that the fan so often has a different set of priorities than the athlete. Um, you see countless times across sports where people say, oh, are you thinking about, and the, maybe the only thing that, that carries real cachet is an undefeated season, um, which is a lot, you know, it's hard in any, whatever sport you're in. Yeah. But, but athletes like, oh, you know, you, you could have had, and then you, you, you know, you dish, you miss it, you know, you could have had the triple doubles, but, you know, you made the pass instead of taking the shot, and they're like, we're here to win. So in team sports, you could see there's a goal, right? And it's easy to see the individual step back and let the team be successful. In individual sports, we tend to think that that athlete has got to be so focused on every competition and so selfish. Um, and there's, you know that she thought about that. And you know that it wasn't a team decision because there were other climbers from the Federation here. You know that she needs to practice speed. You know that back-to-back -back events cause high risk of injury, difficulty for training, maybe all these other things. So the casual viewer is like, but you could have had a record. And Jan is thinking, I have way bigger fish to fry. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a, it's an imbalance that, you know, comes up relatively often. And it's, it provides this, well, this kind of conversation for one, but it provides an interesting perspective into where, where are the real priorities in an athlete's career? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. And I, you know, I don't think any of us can argue with the benefits that uh, that you're going to get from something like uh, uh, an Olympic Games, especially a win, but I just hope that the priority there's not the priorities. The um, I hope the rewards of climbing competitions can start to compete with the rewards that come from an Olympic Games. The, I mean, the cost of competing at an Olympics is going to go down if you don't have to train all three disciplines, right? Like it's not going to be as big a deal that there is the Olympics in 2028, because you can just keep training bouldering like you were always going to. So it's not as, right. as big a deal, but man, you, you really wish that there was a, a, a little more parity between what you gain from winning a world cup compared to winning an Olympic games, which is frankly the same number of days. And in this case, fewer boulder problems. So you're like, God, <laughs> I really? agree. I agree. But yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. There's I'm, always going to be a, what if with this competition, right? It, people, uh, c competition climbing fans 20 years 30 years from now they're going to be sitting around the bar saying uh, oh what if yanya had had participated in that in that first salt lake world cup you know would her streak have have continued it's just going to be a there's always going to be kind of that uh that question around this event yeah but to take and it then away the from natalia side. right right and i think the flip side of that is imagine yanya um comes to this first event uh and gets hurt and people say imagine if she had just treated it like a training comp and focused on, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I, sure. I think the, you can what if, and that's part of the beauty of being a fan is you're allowed to what if all you like. Um, and until an athlete comes down and sits across the table in the bar and says, I'll tell you exactly what happened, you know, 15 years ago, um, then we get to speculate. All right. Uh, my biggest loser, John, John, you took the Anya one, which is great. I'm glad you did. Uh, first honorable mention for biggest loser is anybody having to watch a replay on the fucking stream. There's still no tag that says replay when they show a replay on the stream. And it's so confusing sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's lit. It's like it's six letters. It's, it's actually six letters. It doesn't even have to look good. Just type the word replay in the top left. And I know they can do it because much cheaper, smaller operations can manage that. So please... Please, God, have that fixed for, if not next know, week, I please for Innsbruck. Guy. God. I might know a guy. They can talk to the guy that absolutely has you, control over that. Gee, if this is the first time they've heard this request, um, that's going to drive me crazy. But yeah, if that, hey man, if you, I'll, I'll send you a check if you can get that fixed for next week. But anyway, uh, my actual, yeah. my actual biggest loser uh, to me is Shauna Coxie. Um, who came in, like like we were mentioning, as one of only three competitors this weekend who have won World Cups in the past, and Shauna's won a bunch of them. 
um, also an Olympian. So this year is kind of just ramping up to the Olympics and she didn't compete in Maringen. She's not competing uh, next week either. So this was kind of her, not only her first foray back into comp since 2019 after a bunch of surgeries and stuff. Um, but the fact that it went so badly, so close to the Olympics has to mess with your head and your trust in the process. Like, she came in optimistic about just like, you know, I have to go find out how this is going to go. I don't think she had unrealistic expectations for herself, but like ending it, what was it like 35th ish out of like, like out of yeah. like 50 climbers for someone like Shauna. It, like it's it, honestly, it's normal when you like, we had like what year Nathaniel Coleman and Sean McCall all dropped out of uh, all dropped out of qualifiers they were kind of like a cohort fairly close together in the men's field you almost expect that because there's so many good talents that that's frequent but in the women's field that's not that common you expect shauna to go to semis if not finals and i can't imagine like athlete i'm not an athlete so they're a different breed of of you know coping with this kind of stuff but i'm not shaking that out of my head with only a couple months going to the Olympics, that has got to be such a huge mental hurdle to climb and how she must be thinking about her climbing now after such a disappointing finish. Like, dude, if she comes back with a great performance in Tokyo, that'll be seen as a huge comeback after such a bad, like there's, there's no other way to say it. It just, it was a, it was a really bad performance. She's never missed a semi in her entire career. Was that her first semi she missed? That's the first time she missed. And, and we we decide who to interview after qualies before qualifiers because they focus on that athlete and get a, a bunch of footage of them. Right. And, uh, you know, I got the text, you know, we're going to interview Shauna. And when I was like, this is going to be like a little bit hard. And I asked her, I said, hey, we want to interview you. You know, I found her in the crowd. And, you know, is that OK? And she said, yeah, yeah, that's OK. And I said, how are you feeling? She said, I haven't processed it yet. Um, it just, it's going to take some time. And then we come into it and she's, I mean, I'm just going to add a little extra tip of the hat. She was despondent sitting in the crowd with her coach and, you know, said, we're ready. And she came around the back and stood in front of the backdrop and picked up the mic and went, yeah, big smile, super engaged, super energetic, wonderful answers to the questions. Um, and then, you know, I just had a bit of a little bit of chat after and I, I asked her, I said, what do you What's your process for a bad result? And she said, it's been so long since I've had one, it's hard to remember. Um, you know, do I lock it in a box and throw it away? Do I go home and, and think about it and, and, post and, and work on what I need to do? Um, does it dent your confidence at all or not? And I, know, I think it's hard to dent the confidence of somebody that's never missed a semifinal. You know, that's the blip, you know. Um, but it's, it is a really interesting place to be in to suddenly say, wait a minute you know, where am I at? But I did want to just note absolutely wonderful professional turned on the, uh, the presence to not be, you know, sad and mopey during an interview. And I, I really respected that. This kind of is something I wanted to ask both of you when I was coming up with some questions. So <laughs> at the risk of sounding too alliterative, I said, I wanted to ask you, is you, both of you, is it working is it weird or is it totally wrecked to have the Olympians um, participating in this World Cup, in, in these early World Cups? Because frankly, Tyler, you said you're not an athlete, but you are a fan and we're all fans. And and imagine that you're maybe a, a more casual fan and you're just kind of learning about competition climbing because of this Olympic hype, right? You're learning about, I don't want to pick on specific competitors because we've seen it's not just it's not just Shauna we've seen this with a number of other Olympians where they haven't really had a good start to this to the season so far the World Cup season um, that looks bad for their personal brand right or, or at the very least it just maybe looks a little strange to, to have like somebody who's new to this tuning in thinking oh I want to watch these Olympians they're going to crush it and then it's like they don't even make it out of qualifiers. So my question to you is, yeah, is it is it working to have them there? Is it weird or is it totally wrecked? Should these Olympians have just maybe continued training, not participate in the World Cups at all at the risk of damaging or, or kind of their, their kind of public image or whatever you want to say? I, I think it's a really it. interesting question. And I'll, I'll take my the conversation I had with Sean McCall. Um, and 
he said, there is no way you want the Olympics to be your first comp of the year. It's just, it's an impossibility. Um, I talked to Sean Bailey as well about the, the difference between um, having a training session, like climbing in the cave, where you're by yourself, uh, and, and Sean McCall mirrored the same thing. So you can train really hard at home and have a move and go, well, that's impossible because there's no one there to come and do it and make you go, no, it's not. I'm actually not trying hard enough. If you've, if you've trained to climb at all, um, and I had, you know, I had for many years, sometimes the only thing missing is try hard. So you can have the beta, you can have all the things. You think you're trying as hard as you can until some extra motivation kicks in and you think maybe that was only 90%. So being in the environment of competition cannot be discounted. And I get your point, but Sean said, practice this weekend and next weekend of practice. But do you think, and is he, it bad for the sport? I don't know. Well, well do you think that that, I, I understand that makes total sense. This desire to have actual like real time competition rather than just kind of at home at the gym preparation before the Olympics. But do you think that desire to have real that benefit from having actual competition outweighs maybe like the dent in confidence that would come with like, geez, you don't even make it out of qualities, you know? It's close, but I think that athletes with that amount of, and I was going to say confidence, but I'm just going to say experience, know what they're training for and they know where they're at in their, in their process. And they know that, you recognize when you're rusty and not rusty and you recognize uh, when you've been consistently good and have a bad day versus consistently average and might have a spike of a good event and then you're fighting to get back. When you, when you sit down by yourself at home, not in front of anyone else and answering a question, you, you are honest enough to say, man, I'm fighting for average and that was a good day and that can't immediately become my new normal. And the reverse is true. When you're having uh, a bad streak you have to say that it will go back and i think one of the the greatest examples is baseball players and basketball players where i mean if you bat if you bat 30 percent through your whole career you're in the hall of fame imagine only being 30 percent good at something and being one of the best in your sport and you have to just step up every time and say well i'm going to hit this one basketball players the same way you shoot 40 or 50 percent from the field you're shooting really really well you might break a bunch in a row and then you, you can't say, don't pass it to me. So every time they step up, they're like, I'm going to sink this one. Um, and I think you have to apply that same mentality to competition of, of anything, especially now when we're talking about climbing. You have to walk into every comp going, absolutely, I have what it takes. And I'm going to do everything I can. If you have a bad round, you, you, know, you process and move on. I, I think Pete's example there is perfect for especially describing how I would kind of think about Shauna's situation. Like of the three options you gave, you gave, is it working? Is it weird or is it wrecked? Yeah. For Shauna, my first thing is like, it's not, it can't be working. Like this is bad guys. But the extra condition for her is she's coping with an entirely different physical, medical, surgical condition that she has never had to deal with before so she's just got to confront this stuff right like you got to start at some point and 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 what pete's saying is like you just got to do it you got to try otherwise you're not going to succeed so so she's kind of in a league of her own but it's interesting i would probably average it at it's weird for most athletes but some of them it's working like brooke rabbitu is having the best seasons like so far it's only two events she's having the best season of her life like she was i was not impressed seeing her qualify at Hachioji, like she's I, she's a great climber. She has a legendary name, but she is not top level World Cup climber in any discipline at the end of 2019 in my head. Right. Like she was one of those ones where I was kind of surprised that it worked out for her. I don't feel that same way after these last two events where she's come, what, ninth and third or whatever. Like she actually looks like a competitive top tier uh, boulderer. So, you know. I, I, th I think Pete's angle is probably the right one to take where no matter where you are, you just got to find out. You got to stay in the game. Um, but it's, it is interesting watching all these athletes have very different um, lead ups in terms of uh, mm -hmm. how they perceive themselves and how the public perceives themselves. And, and I'm going to be very curious to see how the Speed World Cup changes people's perceptions because uh, um, uh, just last night... Um, uh, Nikki from the uh, beta root setting page, he posted an interview he did with uh, the U.S. 
coach Josh Larson and Josh Larson brought up this point how it's very interesting that most of the Olympians aren't sharing their speed times publicly. Whereas you've got athletes from freaking everywhere talking about breaking five seconds and shit, right? Like just cherry pick the one result that was good and don't tell anybody about the other hundred results. But the Olympians are completely mum on what their speed results are. And I think the narrative is going to change uh, for, for them once they learn everybody else's speed results um uh and for the public uh as we get to know these things so i think it is weird it is just weird mm-hmm. but for some it's working and for some i'm sure they aren't in a place uh, they want but it, it is a great point john I, I think another example of of who it's working for would be Jacob. i just wanted to say this because i have is he lagging out for you too uh pete yeah he just a disappeared Oh, oh am I he's back? back now. You're back now. You're back. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where I cut off, but I was going to say, I think uh, Jakob Schubert, he was an, another of my picks for kind of an honorable mention for the winners um, because, you know, he didn't make, I don't think he made it out of qualies at Meiringen, correct? No, um, he, was, he was one of those. He was a lucky commentator in semifinals. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, right. And then that's right. That's right. And then, and then at this comp, uh, of course, he kind of comes back, uh, jumps back, gets redemption, makes you know, makes finals, has a great showing. Um, so he would just be another case where, where I, I, I suppose it is working for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a weird one. Yeah. Guys. Agreed. Yeah. All right. Um, Tyler, yeah. if I could, if I, if I could mention one, uh, another kind of honorable mention for the losers, that's kind of a weird, <laughs> that's kind of a weird phrase, Get but, uh, <laughs> second worst, second worst. Second yeah. worst right? Something that I wanted to say is, it's interesting. Um, I think there are a lot of powerhouse teams that I would kind of put in the loser category at this point in the season. We've had a couple World Cups now. Um, and if you look at the finals from Meiringen and from Salt Lake so far, it's really been the story of five teams, right? It's been the U.S., um, it's been Austria, it's been Slovenia, it's been Japan, and it's been France and Adam Andra, right? So it's like five teams and Adam Andra. So, so far, I'm, I'm sitting here after these two World Cups saying, where is Team Germany, right? Where is Russia? Where is Switzerland? Where is Italy? Uh, we know the case with Korea. They aren't participating. Um, and I'm not to say that those athletes haven't done, done bad, like uh, athletes from those, all those countries placed respectively, but didn't make finals in either Meiringen or um, Salt Lake. So, so a couple uh, powerhouse teams that we're yet to really see in the finals, much less um, on a podium. Yeah, I think between just the unusual attendance, um, but also like the one country you mentioned there, Germany, like Germany is one of those ones where it feels like kind of like Austria in some cases in the past couple of years and also France in the past is it's like, where are the new kids? Like, I know there are new climbers that are getting into semifinals and stuff, but like Jan Hoyer in my head was like, you know a bit of a wonderkind the last time I checked, but he's getting old, man. Like he turns 29 yep. this year or something. Like he's not, he ain't, he's not, he ain't new. So like, where are those next German climbers who we want to start poking into finals? I don't see them yet. So that's another country where like, I mean, Germany was, has, it's been a long time since they had like a super, super, superstar um, on the well, scene. Well, but he's kind yeah. of, he's kind of that Andre case where it's, it doesn't feel like he's, fully invested in competition when you look at his whole career i know in the like recent seasons yes. seasons he has been but um I, I i don't i don't think of magos as like an exclusively comp climber i don't think anybody does no i i feel like he'd rather not be here but also i don't even think about him outside of lead climbing like to me he's the rest of it is just because the olympics were a thing and when, once the olympics is over i'd be curious to see if we see him at all like i don't know like, he looks it's funny he looks so relaxed it <laughs> When you and when you think about the result, like the implications of Boulder World Cups to his climbing pedigree, they're a blip. And so maybe that's. I mean, he doesn't. He doesn't have a great result from this event, but um, it doesn't look like it bothers him. Yeah. Because I don't think it does. Yeah. No. I, I. I feel the same. So like, I don't know what the what the next stars are, but like, you know that the the Yuli Jan Hoyer magic was like seven years ago. Like, yeah, it feels like pretty well very long ago, but it was a while yeah. ago. Yeah. So, yeah, that just them specifically as a country. But, yeah, it's an interesting point about teams. But I think it's just so hard to judge because some countries just like they're just not showing up for now, at least like for these first couple of events. Maybe when we get to Innsbruck, things will change when you finally get lead climbing in the mix. 
Um, maybe mm. maybe it'll have to wait till the Asian World Cups before we actually get to see some Asian climbers on the on the World Cup stage. Um, but hopefully hopefully it's Innsbruck. I mean, I, I know that Japan is sending actually some of their legit climbers. Sorry, that's so demeaning. They're sending their very <laughs> best climbers. <laughs> The rest of you guys don't even matter. Uh, but yeah, no, there's like, you know, Akio and um, uh, Tomoa and Kai are actually going to show up for SLC2. Um, so, you know, maybe maybe we'll see that from other countries as well. But yeah, it's it'll be it's just a weird year, like between COVID and the Olympics. It's just like you can't count on anything. It's just not the scene it was two years ago. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, Pete. Do you have anything uh, you want to you want to say to people? Just because we're going to kind of wrap it up, and uh, I don't know if you have anything you want to plug, or if you desperately want people to email you all of their feedback about your commentary. If you have a direct phone number you'd like them to call whenever they have a, a spur of the moment, you know, thought about who you are. It's it's funny because you that's you've just touched on two things. So um, one is that I would encourage people to remember that the goal of a broadcast, especially when you're expanding. So the, the, this broadcast was picked up by um, 17 TV channels around the world. So it's not just the YouTube stream anymore. And the mandate is to make climbing accessible. So you cannot talk over casual viewers, first time viewers, people who are being introduced to the sport. So there is balance in can you explain to the new viewer in a way that they will understand the complexity of movement, why something is difficult, why someone is failing, and why someone is making it look easy, while not alienating people who've been longtime fans who sit back and go, oh, my God. You know? And so I, I do my very best to have that balance um, and working with a co-commentator who has that level of experience as well where you can get down into the actual you know the angle of someone's toe placement being the difference and then while at the same time explaining what a barn door is um, so that balance is important and I, w- I would encourage people who are longtime viewers of competition climbing to remember that we are trying to broaden it out to not talk over somebody who then becomes disinterested and leaves and doesn't watch the sport anymore. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that I try very, very hard not to look at comments because haters are always going to hate and you will read some terrible, and I have over the years, I've read some terrible things about myself, um, which you have to believe are the anomaly. So you kind of look at a few comments and then you turn them off and some this guy, like, and I read, this guy's clueless. He has no idea what he's talking about. I was like, he does. He's, he's been at this for 25 years. Um, he's a very knowledgeable climber who is trying to just take it down a level so that it's not alienating people. So that's what I would like people to remember. And I know I do not want to give out my phone number because I think it <laughs> would be more <laughs> negative than positive. And in order to not go insane as a public figure, you have to be able to say, there are always going to be people who wish it was someone else or who think you're not good at what you do or don't like your style. And you just have to continue being you and just own it. And that's all I'm trying to do. Yeah. Well, he doesn't want to give it, but we'll put his phone number in the description. So you guys can all. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're like, hey, he said no, but here it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, that was, that was, it was great to, uh, to catch up with you. It was really nice to just talk to for two people who were actually there. It's a nice change. You know, 2019, mm-hmm. John and I didn't, John went to one, but you know, for the rest of them, we didn't have that opportunity. So it was great to, uh, to talk to you. It was great to get into the mind of an IFSC commentator right after it's happened. And, you know, after your first experience and hopefully people know you a bit better and understand your angle going into the second week which starts on uh friday is it speed friday and then bouldering saturday sunday correct speed goes on uh they finish it in a day so they go practice qualifiers uh semis finals in the same day and then we go qualifiers on saturday for boulder and then semis and finals on sunday okay cool so a, a bit of a change from the normal schedule so so you'll have to get used to watching competitions on sunday uh but it's gonna be great like uh, i mean first of all you get some of those bigger uh names showing back up yanya's back akio's back tomoa's back kai's back it's gonna be sick 
Um, and the speed is going to be a weird speed comp. Like there's not a lot of big names registered. I'm kind of ready to put money on a three way Polish speed podium for the women's <laughs> category. I think they might have it locked unless somebody uh, surprises us, but it'll be the debut of speed for the 2021 season. So uh, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Tyler, the big uh, and the big kind of buzz is is whether or not the men's world record might get broken this season because we've seen the women's world record get broken a couple times over the past you know whatever year or two, whereas that men's record, Reza, it's just like stayed the same and it's kind of it's just kind of uh, kind of odd that the the women's has been broken a number of times whereas the men's has not. So of course that's built this anticipation of well maybe this will be the year that the that the men's world record gets gets broken. So. Yeah, I'm I'm excited for that too. I think I think it is likely that we get a record breaking. I know some people are like preparing themselves for a sub five time. I, I'm I'm not there yet. Like you, have, like the men's speed record has has you know has uh, been reduced very very slowly like i don't think people realize like how long it's taken to get where it is right now like we were talking like it broke six seconds nine years ago so it's taken about like eight mm -hmm. years to get it down half of a second right um so the idea of dropping another half second off the time in a comp i understand that some people have done it in practice dope but like you got to do it at a comp you have to do it against competition you're not familiar with you have to do it under that pressure so i'm i'm pretty pretty bearish on the sub five but i would love to see a new men's world record uh uh in salt lake city i, th I think it's that interesting where, where there's this assumption that the the improvement is infinite you know, right, like, right. Well, well, how come we're not running seven second hundred meters? At yeah. the, you know, it, <laughs> there is a human cap yeah. to the ability to do something. And the, the men approached it uh, a while ago and the women have caught up in, in terms of that, the jumps in improvement. And I think now we're going to be seeing, you know, uh, hundreds of seconds mm -hmm. rather than tenths of seconds being the incremental improvements because they're... You, I've, people don't make mistakes yeah. and still can't quite get there. So there's got to be some kind of magic to break that record. Yeah. There, there is, but the, I, I guess, and I agree, Pete, but the only thing is like something like the Tomoa skip proves that like there is innovation. You know, that was a recent thing, relatively speaking. And like, that just proves that there's, there's still room to make like, to make huge leaps in no pun intended in terms of um, like evolution of the, of the, uh, of, of the, the men's um, or women's for that matter of kind of how it's run. Yeah. So yeah. Excellent point. Excellent point. And even on the women's side, um, you know, finding, cause they're not going to use the same beta as the men. It's not always going to be the same exact functionality, but maybe somebody has a breakthrough moment uh, on the women's side and says, bam, I can take a half a second off uh, yeah. just immediately. So that's an excellent point. Yeah. Well, let's leave it there. Um, thank you very much for watching this episode of The Debrief. You know, I just realized that the subtitle for this video isn't centered, and it's been like that the whole time. Can you believe that? Look at that. IFSC First Salt Lake City Bowler World Cup, and it's off the edge. Damn it! Guys, we got to start over now. Shit. Uh, anyway. Thank you very much to uh, uh, MC Pete Woods, who you can all watch again uh, next week for the second uh, edition of the Salt Lake City World Cup uh, in speed and boulder starting on Friday. Thank you, as always, to John Bergman. Uh, make sure you pick up his book at the link in the description. And of course, if you enjoyed this, you can always support it by checking out our Patreon. Uh, you can earn stickers for yourself, uh, or you can ask questions on shows like these, or you can even be on a show yourself if you are rolling in that much cash. Uh, and of course, join the Plastic Weekly Discord if the YouTube chat is a little too much for you come hang out with a smaller group of people who are are really nerdy about it whether you're chatting in text or in voice with a few of us uh, we would just love to talk to people from around the world with different perspectives on climbing so thanks again we will see you guys next week after the second salt lake city world cup enjoy the comp we'll see you then